It's now, now a, a great pleasure to turn to, to invite Dr. Ed Horton. Ed is a, a, another old friend of mine, um, old young friend of mine, um, <laughs> from days when we, uh, we were on the uh, American Diabetes Association's Nutrition Committee. Um, he strayed from, from, from that path and went, went off, uh, finally being the... Uh, Director of Diabetes at the, at the Jocelyn Center at Harvard, um, where he's, uh, he's he currently is 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 is, is chair, uh, professor of medicine. Um, obviously, Ed uh, Ed has tremendous experience, although he in 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 the whole lifestyle factor as a as a sort of uh, skiing Olympian um, uh, from the past, uh, who who then. Uh, went heavily into medicine and uh, landed up on the nutrition committee of ADA. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to to have Ed back to talk about another of the of the great trials that uh, that uh, have uh, shaping the way our thinking and where we we need more guidance, which is the look ahead. So Ed, welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, th thank you very much, uh, David and. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. It's, it still is morning, I noticed. So uh, uh, this has been a terrific uh, uh, Congress. Uh, I've learned a great deal. Uh, it's been wonderful for me to see uh, some old friends and have uh, just a chance informally to uh, talk about uh, uh, things. And uh, so I really want to uh, thank all the organizing committee for putting together such a, a terrific uh, program. Uh, I want to thank Herzl for his talk because he set this up perfectly. I mean, I cannot think of a better introduction uh, to talk about the look-ahead trial uh, than uh, what um, Herzl has uh, told us this morning. Um, my disclosures, uh, uh, I have been told that my travel here from Boston, uh, I'll get some uh, support for that, so I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I uh, do have relationships with uh, several companies, uh, either as an uh, advisory board member or consulting member. Uh, and uh, I have received uh, a few uh, uh, speakers' uh, uh, fees from uh, uh, companies uh, over the years, but none of them really uh, interact with what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, uh, the Look Ahead trial is uh, supported by the National Institutes of Health. It's a large multi-center trial uh, involving uh, 16 centers scattered around the United States. Uh, and it really uh, is looking at uh, lifestyle interventions, uh, and most of my conflicts have, have, would be with the, with the pharmaceutical industry. And I wanted to point out that the medical care in the Look Ahead trial was not provided by uh, us as the investigators. It was provided by the primary care doctors uh, of the individual physicians. So they were actually the ones who were taking care of the diabetes management and uh, all of the other comorbidities, the lipids, the blood pressure, uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, we really did not, uh, the only actual, uh, we did have an algorithm for adjusting insulin doses uh, in the intensive lifestyle group when we were putting them on caloric restriction and increasing their physical activity. So we did have an algorithm for that, and our, our, our staff in the studies uh, um, actually implemented that algorithm, but everything else was really uh, left up to uh, their, their family physicians. Um, we've heard a lot at this meeting about this, what people are calling the dual epidemic, and I thought I'd just uh, review uh, some of the recent data in the U.S. 65% um, of adult Americans, two-thirds of adult Americans are overweight as measured by a body mass index of greater than 25, and one-third uh, are obese uh, with a BMI of greater than 30. So there's really no question that we have an epidemic of, uh, of obesity going on in the U.S., Current numbers uh, uh, estimated uh, about uh, 26 million. I think it's now up to 29 million or slightly higher, uh, or about 11, uh, more than 11 percent of adults uh, uh, with diabetes. Uh, but uh, 79, to, I think the latest figure I saw was 85 million people with prediabetes, either impaired fasting glucose or, or impaired glucose tolerance. 
And the lifetime risk of developing diabetes in the 15-year-old kids running around now uh, is estimated to be as high as 33% uh, uh, for men and, uh, and close to 40% for women. So there's no question that we're just really trying to deal with this uh, epidemic. And we all know from our discussions that uh, in this population, cardiovascular disease uh, is uh, the leading cause uh, of uh, mortality. Uh, and uh, uh, this, I think, has uh, is gotten our attention over the last uh, uh, several years. I, I know when I started out in diabetes, uh, we were really focusing just on diabetic control and trying to reduce risk of the microvascular complications. Uh, but now, uh, I think, uh, uh, most of us are really turning our attention to the very, very high risk for uh, cardiovascular disease. So I wanted to um, then tell you, uh, bring you up to date on where we stand with the Look Ahead trial. And 15 to 20 years ago, when we were planning uh, this trial, uh, there were many studies that showed that improved glucose control in people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes reduce the risk for microvascular complications. But we really did not have solid data that good glucose control could uh, decrease the risk for cardiovascular disease events. Uh, and uh, we were just beginning to learn about that. And we were learning about the interactions between glucose, lipids, blood pressure, uh, and so forth in, in this population. So we decided uh, uh, to really design a trial uh, to look at uh, uh, the uh, whether cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in people with type 2 diabetes could be reduced through an intensive lifestyle intervention uh, aimed at uh, producing and maintaining weight loss. That, that was the primary goal. And now this program was a combination of both uh, uh, dietary restriction and increased physical activity, and I'll, I'll just um, show you that. But the primary outcome for the Look Ahead trial was uh, to look at the incidence rate of the first post-randomization of occurrence of a composite outcome. And this included cardiovascular death, either fatal myocardial infarction or stroke, a non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for severe angina. Uh, we included that in this uh, composite primary outcome. And we plan to follow people for 13 and a half years uh, to uh, uh, and randomize them into either an intensive lifestyle intervention program or a control group that we call the Diabetes Support and Education Group. And I'll describe uh, these two. Now, we have actually predefined a series of secondary outcomes, all related to the cardiovascular uh, disease outcomes. Uh, and uh, uh, these were just the various uh, subcomponents of the uh, primary outcome. So here are the two groups. Intensive Lifestyle Intervention, what we call ILI, uh, and the Diabetes Support and Education that we call DSE. Uh, the baseline characteristics of the participants, uh, we had slightly more than 2,500 in each of the uh, groups. Uh, they were 60% women. Uh, we tried to make it as representative of the U.S. population as we could, and we had 37 percent representing various uh, ethnic and minority groups in the U.S. Average age, uh, about close to 59 years, an older population. Uh, I didn't put it on this slide, uh, but the average duration of diabetes, as best we could determine by history, was between 8 and 12 years of diabetes. So these are people who are older, they've had diabetes already for 8 to 10 to 12 years, uh, so they're farther down the pike uh, than the group that we were looking at in the Diabetes Prevention Program and other studies looking at early intervention. Um, on purpose, we uh, limited the number of people that in the uh, the, that we selected to about 15% uh, uh, taking insulin, uh, and uh, uh, they were overweight or obese. The uh, mean baseline body mass index was uh, uh, close to 36. Uh, average weight was uh, uh, just about 100 kilograms, so, so that makes it very convenient because percent weight loss is also kilogram weight loss, right? <laughs> so, so you can go back percent and kilos very quickly here. Um, and uh, their waist circumference uh, uh, was uh, increased, uh, uh, and uh, they uh, about 15% had a prior history 
pre-existing history of a coronary uh, 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 vascular disease. So uh, we did the power analysis. And then, uh, this is back 15 years ago. Her Herzl, you, you know, you're talking about the large ends we need. So what we did is we uh, actually planned on a sample size of 5,000 participants in this study. And we thought we'd have an 80% probability of detecting an 18% difference in cardiovascular events between the two arms, assuming uh, a p-value of uh, 0.05 but a primary outcome rate of 2% per year. And we got that uh, from reviewing all the literature on the current data on cardiovascular disease in our diabetic population and what the, uh, the event rate would be. So we, we planned 2% per year, uh, and uh, uh, we planned a follow-up of 13 and a half years. So that was the power calculation back in the late 1990s, okay? Um, and I think this is important when I talk about the results. Okay, the, uh, the lifestyle intervention phase, uh, we divided into two initial phases. The first six months, uh, we had weekly contact with the people in the ILI group. Uh, this was three group sessions a month and one individual counseling session a month. We set a personal weight loss goal of 10%, hoping that we would get a study-wide weight loss of, of 7%. And, and this was based on uh, kind of the results from the lifestyle intervention that we had uh, observed in the diabetes prevention program, uh, uh, just, uh, which was actually just uh, uh, coming to fruition at, at that time. Uh, we uh, basically uh, reduced the calories, modest weight reduction, uh, calorie reduction. Uh, uh, at the time, we uh, were thinking in terms of the American Heart Association and the ADA recommendations, reduced total fat in the diet to 30% or less, saturated fat in the range of 7 to 10% uh, uh, of calories. Uh, we did use uh, some meal replacements during this initial phase to get people into the weight reduction program, gave them menu plans, uh, and then for the physical activity, we asked them to gradually increase their physical activity to a total of at least 175 minutes a day of uh, a moderate intensity exercise, such as brisk walking uh, or the equivalent. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and we, we developed a program we called 10,000 Steps, which uh, is uh, walking about five miles a day. Uh, and so we really pushed the, the walking program as a major intervention here. Now, the second uh, six months of the program, we backed off a little bit. Uh, we didn't uh, see them quite so often. Uh, we had uh, uh, some telephone uh, conversations with the patients. Uh, and for those who had not achieved their 10% weight loss, we asked them to continue to lose weight. But if they'd made the 10% goal, uh, we asked them uh, to uh, at least maintain that uh, weight loss during that period. Now, for the control group, uh, we actually just had meetings with them three to four times a year as a group meeting and gave them some general talks about diabetes and, and diabetes management and so forth. We talked about diet, exercise, uh, social support, uh, but this was not an active intervention. This was primarily to keep them enrolled in the study. Uh, so it was not an active intervention, but we, we did see them to, to keep contact with them and encourage them. So here's the one-year weight loss results. We were really thrilled. Uh, we got an average of 8.6% weight reduction uh, in the uh, intensive lifestyle intervention group and really no significant change in the control group. So we said, hey, wow, this really works. I, we were able to achieve the, the weight loss program. Uh, now, I'm not going to uh, show you uh, much of the uh, one-year data. Uh, just here's the impact on glucose control. Um, the hemoglobin A1C dropped by point, a little over 0.6%, uh, which would be enough to get it approved as a drug by the FDA, just barely. Uh, but we did get improvement in A1C. Fasting glucose uh, dropped by uh, uh, 21 and a half milligram per deciliter. Uh, and uh, uh, we saw a, a close to an 8% reduction in their anti-diabetic medications. So the improvement in glycemia was associated with actually a decrease in the need for taking uh, mostly oral agents, but it was also a significant reduction in the insulin doses in those who had uh, been taking insulin. 
Uh, so uh, we saw major improvements here. Now, I'm not going to show you the data, but we also uh, saw uh, improvement in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh, with less use of antihypertensive medication. Uh, and uh, we saw a decrease in triglycerides and an increase in HDL cholesterol, but no change in the LDL cholesterol uh, during this first year. Uh, but what I'm going to do is now fast forward to the 10-year results. Uh, and I think many of you have probably seen these. Uh, they've been published uh, uh, during the last year or so. But here are the weight changes. And I want to point out two things. We got uh, in the intensive lifestyle group uh, the uh, uh, maximum weight loss at the end of one year. But you can see uh, there was some regain of weight during the next two, three, four years. And then it flattened off and then has begun to drift down again. But still, we have a, um, a, uh, about a 5%, uh, 4 to 5% weight loss compared to their baseline during the entire 10 years of the study. But look at what happened to the control group. We had actually predicted, and I heard somebody mention this yesterday, uh, that uh, the control group was actually going to stay the same or gain weight. Uh, but they came down, OK, too. So they, we're seeing a, the control group actually showing some improvement of weight. But there's still a statistically significant difference in the weight between the two groups. Here's the A1C, OK? Yeah, the A1C is a kind of a crept back up again. Uh, and uh, uh, we're not able to maintain that tremendous improvement in A1C. It's still statistically significantly better than the control group but still uh, nothing uh, really, in my opinion, to write home about. Here are the blood pressure changes. The, look at the systolic and diastolic pressures, which dropped very dramatically. Uh, the uh, diastolic has stayed down, but the systolic has begun to come back up again. But again, look what's happened to the control group. We've seen improvement in both systolic and diastolic uh, pressures in the control group. And uh, that is associated with more use of antihypertensive medications in this group. Here are the HDL and triglyceride results. Uh, the HDL went up nicely in the uh, group, but look what, what happened in the control group. It's gone up, too. Uh, and the triglycerides have come down uh, very dramatically in both groups. So we've seen improvement in the lipid profiles in both groups, both the control group and the lifestyle group. And actually, LDL cholesterol came down more in the control group than it did in the, in the lifestyle group uh, because there was greater use of statins and other uh, dyslipidemic drugs. So I think you're beginning to get the message now. You know, there, there's two ways to deal with all of these, uh, uh, these uh, um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. You can take more medication, which we're seeing as general trends in our population. And our control group was getting all the messages. You know, they were seeing their doctors. They were being started on blood pressure medications, statins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I think some of them were increasing their exercise some, too. And uh, there's no question that there was a group. So here are the differences. The ILA had better weight loss throughout the trial. They had greater improvements in their physical fitness. I didn't show you those data, but they, they did. They did very well. They actually exceeded our 175 minutes a week uh, uh, goal. Uh, I think it was 215 uh, minutes a week was average during that first year. Uh, but they've uh, slacked off on that, too, over time. Uh, they, uh, they reduced their glycated hemoglobin and their need for insulin. That, that was very positive results. Uh, they did have sustained improvements in sus uh, systolic uh, blood pressure and HDL cholesterol, but they had the less improvement in the uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, but they used the fewer statins to get there. Um, so, okay, the question is, did the ILI reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality? That was our primary outcome variable that we are interested in. Uh, and uh, this was the analysis of the time to the first post-randomization occurrence of the primary and secondary outcomes in the two groups. Here are the results. No difference. No difference at all. OK? You can see that the, the uh, DSE and the ILI group uh, basically had the same rate of uh, cardiovascular events uh, during the course of this study. And then if you subdivide the groups, uh, looking at those who 
uh, did not have any uh, cardiovascular uh, disease or event history prior, uh, shown on the left, or those who did. Again, uh, there was uh, no uh, significant difference in the two subgroups. Uh, obviously, those with a prior history of cardiovascular disease had higher rates than those uh, without. Uh, and we did the subgroup analysis, and nothing stands out here. There, there's really no uh, uh, really significant factors, no gender differences, no uh, race or ethnicity differences in, in the results in this study. So the primary study question was answered. There was no significant difference between the ILI and the DSE in the number of heart disease events. That is, both groups had a similar number of cardiovascular events, and the main study question, question answer was negative. Both groups had a very low number of heart disease events. Both groups had less than half of the expected rates. And I think this is a very important uh, factor. I mean, this is good news for all. We just saw a general drop in cardiovascular event rates below what we predicted. It was less than half of what we had predicted uh, back 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and so the question is, well, why uh, did this occur? Uh, many participants are taking medications for their diabetes, high blood pressure and high uh, lipids, more so in the control group than the ILI. These medications combined with regular checkups with a health professional may have kept the CVD uh, rates uh, low in both groups. Uh, the results parallel the overall improvements in cardiovascular disease uh, that we're seeing in the United States in, in recent years. I mean, this is a, a general trend uh, downwards. Uh, and uh, um, I think the, the other question that I want to pose, and Herzl, you may want to comment this. The people who actually signed up for this study are they truly representative of the general population? And I don't think they are, because everybody that I talked to who actually volunteered for this study wanted to be in the intensive lifestyle group. Not, they, they were a little bit disappointed when they got randomized to the control group. So I think this is probably, uh, this study, I'm a great believer in randomized control trials, but the people that volunteer for randomized control trials also have other motivations. They tend to be more motivated. Uh, they, they, they've stuck it out. I mean, we've had over 90% uh, long-term follow-up in both groups. So, so that is another one of your confounding factors that you might want to add to your slide there. When people sign up for a randomized control trial, you know, are they uh, uh, really representative of the uh, general population? <laughs> now, I consider this to be a very positive study. Some people, you know, the press got hold of this and said the results were negative. Uh, I, I'm not going to have time to show you. Uh, we've just published uh, results uh, that the ILI group has uh, uh, a significant decrease in the development of severe uh, uh, renal uh, disease. Uh, I'm currently analyzing the results on neuropathy. We don't have it uh, totally analyzed yet. Uh, we're uh, analyzing some of the results on retinopathy. So we are just analyzing the results on the microvascular complications. But we have published uh, just recently, Bill Noller was the first author on the paper, uh, the results of, of a decrease in uh, uh, severe uh, uh, kidney dysfunction. Um, the other thing that uh, one of my patients brought this up, put this on the top of your list, obstructive sleep apnea. I threw away my CPAP. You know, I went on this program and, my, and I can sleep at night. I don't have my CPAP, but tremendous improvement in that. And I will show you one slide on that. Uh, but now we're looking at the impact on malignancies. Uh, one of the hot areas is cognitive impairment and increased risk for Alzheimer's. We have studies going on in that area. We're doing, doing um, uh, brain MRIs and functional MRI testing in subsets of the population. Just the problems of aging with diabetes, mobility, falls, physical function, uh, and the multi multiple other problems. This gives us an opportunity with a very dedicated and loyal population of people with more advanced diabetes further down the pathway of diabetes and its complications that we can hopefully answer some of these questions as we continue to follow this population uh, over time. I just want to show you only one slide. This is a slide showing the total remission of obstructive sleep apnea at year four. And look at, look at this. The ILI group, 20%. 
uh, had uh, remission of obstructive sleep apnea, and it was uh, only about three or four percent in the control group. So, so I look at this as a very positive study. I'm a great fan of randomized control trials, uh, and uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from continuing to follow um, the, this group of people. So, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you.